Celsius stock is moving huge. This stock is up over 12% right now. In the past two trading days, up over 19%. What is going on with Celsius stock? Well, there's a couple big piece of news that's come out in the last 48 hours in regards to this one. So we'll speak about this uh, here at the top of this video. Then I want to react to a few videos here on the Reaction Channel. First one up here, Tesla Robo Taxis could generate $1.7 trillion of revenue by 2040. That's an insane number. So looking forward to getting into that one. Then we got this video that came out four hours ago. Tesla Robo Taxis will be a game changer, says Webb Bush's Dan Ives. So looking forward to reacting to that one. Calls of the day. PayPal stock's down today, so I'm guessing they got downgraded. So we're going to hear why they got downgraded. Additionally, Nike, uh, there's some sort of analyst move in regards to Nike. So looking forward to reacting to that one. And then last, we'll react to this one. Investors should be overweight equities versus fixed income, says Gabriela Santos of JP Morgan. So looking forward to reacting to that one. By the way, I appreciate everybody joining me as always. Thank you, everybody. All I need from you, hit that like button. Smash that like button. Gently press that like button. That's all I need from you guys for taking the time out of my day to record this video from you. Appreciate each and every one of you for being here. Okay, Celsius. Whoo, baby. This one's getting interesting fast. Okay, so here's what's going on. Okay, this came out yesterday. Winners and losers from Piper Sandler's latest survey on teenagers. You may say, okay, why does a survey of teenagers matter? It matters significantly. The brands that many times you think are cool when you're a teen, many times you carry that through to your 20s and your 30s and, and, and so on and so forth. And if I think about myself, many of the brands that I thought were very cool as a teen, I still think are cool today, right? And many of those brands I still shop with, many of those places I still like, right? Not all of them, but many of them I do. So it's a very important survey that's always done by Piper Sandler every year. And it usually comes out uh, kind of around this time of year as far as the, uh, you know, the, the report. So right off the bat here, Nike and Elf Beauty, two companies I own, this is I like, Nike and Elf Beauty were noted to continue to prove their wallet dominance as number one preference in apparel and beauty. Nike holds strong as the number one brand for all teens in apparel and footwear. That bodes very good for Nike, right? Uh, New Balance improved to the number three spot, doubling its mind share. So good good for New Balance here, but I definitely like that Nike's still the, uh, the big dog in the space, even with teens, right? In apparel, Lululemon kept its number three ranking, but lost four points of mind share among upper income teens. Not great news for Lulu there. In e-commerce, Amazon ranks number one again among upper income teens as a top shopping website. Doesn't come as a surprise to me. The beauty category Category was noted to remain a high priority for teens. The fall survey showed the core beauty wallet reaching its highest level since 2018 at $342, which could be a positive for Alta Beauty and uh, Elf Beauty. Uh, TikTok reported as a favorite social media app among teens, which that doesn't surprise me at all. Instagram came in second. Snapchat came in third. As expected, Netflix was a top choice for teens as it relates to daily video consumption. As for trends overall, Piper Sandler sees the results positive for the teen survey for meta platforms, Roblox, Uber, Pinterest, and DoorDash. The breakdown of teen preference was mixed for Amazon, Google McDougal, and uh, Snapchat. Chick-fil-A continues to remain the preferred restaurant chain for teens, followed by McDonald's and Chipotle. But here's where it comes in for Celsius. Teens prefer energy drinks over coffee and soda as our top source of energy. Monster Beverage, Red Bull, and Celsius held down the top four spots again and collectively gained mind share over Starbucks. So bearish Starbucks, bullish energy drinks. Also bearish soda, right? A lot of the younger generation, they're just not interested in, in soda for the most part, right? Which is which is interesting, which might be good for them. But then again, energy drinks aren't always the best for you either. So, you know, I don't know. Like, like you know, you trade one for the other, right? But the moral of the story is this is definitely bullish for Celsius here in regards to survey. But then this came out here today. Energy Jolt. Celsius Holdings and Monster Beverage gain after trade show buzz. Celsius broke higher on Thursday after Stiefel pointed to some positive developments from the National Association of Convenience Stores trade show today. The analyst said conversations with brand owners and retailers at the, the convention were more upbeat in tone on the potential for convenience store category sales to improve in 2025. Now, Here's the deal, okay, a couple things in regards to this. Convenience store sales haven't been the best uh, in the past really like year. And the, the, I came from the convenience store industry, right? I used to be a manager in that industry for four years. And I know where we built our stores and I know where our stores made the most money and I know what our customer bases were like, okay? 
We didn't usually build our stores in wealthy areas. We usually built many of our stores in, let's call it, uh, middle class areas or below middle class areas. And the reason being is a lot of your customer base in convenience stores, they they go in there, okay? When you're talking about higher income, a lot of those folks look at going to a convenience store as kind of like a waste of money, right? They kind of think like, I'm buying everything at Sam's Club, I'm buying everything at Costco, I'm buying in bulk, I'm not gonna buy individual products, I'm not gonna go buy a Celsius in a individual, I'm gonna buy a case at, at, at Costco or something like that, right? And so think about the folks that have been hurt the worst by inflation in 2022, 2023. And then we've really seen the effects of that negativity, obviously, in 2024, right? What, what, who, who's affected the most? The, obviously, the bottom 50, 60% of income earners. And so that's like the portion of convenience store shoppers. Like that's the heavy portion of convenience store shoppers. Because a lot of people, like I said, of, of upper incomes, they never even go to a convenience store. Like it's a rarity. They ever go to a convenience store and go in there and go shopping and get this and that, right? Um, and so if sales are going to come back there, if that consumer is going to be stronger, then obviously convenience stores are going to be feeling pretty good about their business for 2025. Now, here's the thing, okay? Very important. Who the heck cares if sales are bad or good or not good in one quarter or one year versus another year in this channel, right? As a long-term investor, these companies, it's all going to be irrelevant in the end, right? They mention here about, you know, obviously the hurricane and that could maybe potentially affect sales negatively, right? Like uh, all this stuff is just like, it's here today, gone tomorrow. Like as a long-term investor, it cracks me up that people get so crazy over this and they want to bid the stock up 20% in two days based upon a couple pieces that I don't even think this is surprising. Is it surprising to me that teens prefer energy drinks over soda and coffee? No, that's not a, like, is that shocking news? Like this should not be shocking news to anybody just to be quite frank. And then, uh, you know, the folks feeling better about the convenience store? No, if you understand that finally the bottom 60% of income earners finally is not being sliced and diced by inflation for once, that's going to bode well for that consumer base in, in 2025. And, you know, they, 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 this isn't rocket science in my personal opinion, but people make such big judgments over this short-term stuff. And as a long-term investor, you kind of sit back and say, you know, you guys can go all crazy about this, sell the stock off 60, 70%, then bid it up 20% in two days. Like, what is going on here? Because people freak out and go all crazy about the short-term stuff. Now, when it comes to Celsius, here's the deal. Two-year forward P on this one, 21. Um, next year earnings per share growth should be good. Revenue should be good. It's just a question of like, how good are, are we talking in regards to Celsius? Things are trending in the right direction. I did a very in-depth Celsius video and ELF on the main channel uh, two days ago. So if you're interested in ELF, if you're interested in Celsius, check out that video on the main channel. It's called Buy ELF and Celsius Stock and Don't Stop. That one, that's a you know almost 30 minute video there that goes very in depth on both those two companies and why those stocks have, are uh, you know tremendous value. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in that, you can definitely check out that. By the way, pin comment down there today. I'll put uh, application if you're looking to apply to join my private stock group, my private wealth group, ac access to 1000xstocks.com, all that goody stuff. Then you can check out the pin comment down there and apply to join us in there. All right, let's react to some videos. And in 2020, we expect to have a million robo-taxis on the road with the hardware necessary for full self-driving. We believe we'll have the most profitable autonomous taxi on the market. Yes, that was 2019. That was Musk on an earnings call promising to have a million robo-taxis the following year. It's five years later now, and we're just getting a look at that robo-taxi <laughs> later today. But my next guest says the hype is there and that robo-taxis could generate 1.7 trillion in global revenues by 2040. Jeez. And that's got him upping his price target on Tesla to 236 from 224. Tom Narayan is here. He's from RBC Capital Markets. He's their global autos analyst. Um, yeah. <laughs> Where do we begin? So, By the way, I will say this. Tesla stock actually sets up good going into this event. Here's what I think could actually happen with Tesla. If RoboTaxi Day's a banger and people are confident, like whatever Tesla shows off for different products and services, they, they think there's going to be anything meaningful to revenue in the next one to two years, you're going to see Tesla stock fly for like the next week, essentially, and maybe go to like 275. 290, maybe even 300 or something like that, okay? Now, if, if whatever Tesla shows off, if people aren't confident it's gonna matter for the next two years, you'll see Tesla stock flounder and maybe even downtrend a bit. But if there's anything they show, then the next two years will be meaningful to revenue. 
Tesla actually sets up phenomenal. I gotta say, you know, I would have thought maybe a little more strength into this one, but nope. The, the central point is, while many are skeptical that, you know, Adam Jonas included, that we might hear that much <laughs> uh, really tonight on the arrival me. of the robo taxi, um, you think there might really be something here that, that moves the needle in the near term? No, I, I probably agree with Adam Jonas in that <laughs> near term. Uh, we saw the stock uh, kind of run into this event. Um, we saw that because the delivery number, remember, the stock sold off on that, which makes folks think that it probably traded up into it. So near term, probably, yeah, not a lot of upside, maybe even the sell the news type thing. But this is more about the long term when we look back five or 10 years back and look at this event and, and remember what it means. Folks like me will po finally put this in their numbers, right? Uh, and I think we may get some Easter eggs today, too, that could potentially uh, move the stock near term. And I, in a weird way. Uh, I don't know how many analysts will really put this in their numbers, unless they're thinking something's happening in the next two years. Remember, a lot of these analysts only run two-year out numbers. They'll run what they're expecting for 25 and maybe what they're expecting for 26. But a lot of people aren't running projections and numbers on what they think Tesla's going to be doing for revenues or profits in 2030. That's not super common. It, it's one of those, it's like the line about Trump, right? You take Musk kind of seriously, but not literally. The idea being robo taxis coming. It might just be years longer than, uh, than it takes. Um, but th the impact for shares, you think, is what? That if, the, tell me what exactly you think he's going to announce tonight. What's in the stock already and what's not? Yeah, I think what we'll get is a couple of things. I think we'll get an actual service announcement, like there will be a deployment of some service, and that will be six to 12 months out, uh, something similar to like a Waymo or a Cruise. Um, I think also we'll see a vehicle. I don't know how relevant that will really be. Um, I think we may get some stuff on Optimus. The invitation that we all got said we robot. So maybe beyond just the, the robo taxi itself, We'll get a lot of numbers too, right? The TAM of this whole market opportunity, the economics are amazing. Um, and I think we'll get a lot of information on why their tech is better than what's out there. Thanks to FSD, you know, there's an arms race for NVIDIA chips. They have a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think folks will get a more detailed than just simple uh, you know, PowerPoint slides. We'll get actual numbers that we can put it. Let's see. Uh, this should be interesting here. Let's see where Tesla's at as far as options market goes. Very interested to see this. So let's go here. Let's go to options. And yeah, I want to see tomorrow. So Tesla's trading about two, we can call it 239, 240 right now. Let's see what you have to pay. Oh, dang. So for 240, you got to pay eight bucks. That's a pretty dang big number, right? That's about, well, it's not that crazy. Well, basically you need the stock to go up about, what is that, about 3% from where it's at right now to break even. Let's keep in mind that's break even. So basically you need Tesla stock tomorrow to go up about 3%, right? Um, to break even roughly. So, but Tesla stock could move 5 7% tomorrow. So I don't think the risk reward is that bad, actually, there. Yeah, I don't think it's that bad. And then if you go out here a bit, oh man, look at that. 267.50s. Damn, you got to pay a dollar for those babies? A dollar? So you need the stock to go to 268.50 tomorrow just to break even. So yeah, I mean, if I was, if I was going to do anything here, I'd play right around the money. Uh, cause geez, you need it to go up so high. And plus, if it goes up that high, right, you're going to make a ton of money on this. Cause that, that will then be worth like 30 bucks, right? This will be worth like 30, 40 bucks. So yeah, if, if I was to play anything here, I would go right around those two forties, pay around eight bucks for them and hope this baby goes to like 255, 260, 265, something like that tomorrow on just some major, major excitement. Our models. Um, and that's something that will maybe not have a direct impact near term, but it'll help us with the narrative of looking at this as a tech company and not an auto company, not being focused so much on quarterly deliveries right. and automotive gross margins, X credits, you know, yeah. and focus on something much bigger. That said, Waymo is already there. They beat Tesla to the punch, didn't they? And I'm curious what that means. I mean, at some point it shows that if this is doable, Tesla should be able to do it. But they've got to, it's, they've got to get up to par with Waymo soon, don't you think? 
Well, I mean, as we've shown in our report, it's a 1.7 trillion revenue number by 2040. I only actually have Tesla at around 250 billion of that. Uh, so it's a lot of folks are going to participate in this robo taxi ecosystem. Um, but it, it dramatically improves the profitability of the transportation sector. Uh, you know, you pay a dollar, two dollars for an Uber ride. It only costs 30 cents to operate these. The margins go from like 10% for a car margin to, Eight, 60, 70 percent for a software company. So it dramatically increases the pie for everybody, including Waymo, including Tesla, including app providers like Uber. I mean, a lot of different companies are going to play in this. It's just going to demonstrably increase the size, the pie of overall uh, mobility. All right. Let me leave you with this then. What to you is a sell the news kind of uh, set of announcements or, or, or robo taxi announcement? What robo taxi announcement sends the stock down 10 or 20 percent? Oh, yeah. Certainly if uh, if we don't get, you know, a near term service announcement, if we're told that this is 10, 15 years out, uh, <laughs> if they talked about costs associated with this hmm. being significant. Um, Are the departures yeah, significant? Concrete. We, you know, we continue to see sort of key staff leaving the delay of this event in the first place maybe suggests there's a lot of pressure behind the scenes to make it ready for prime time. Well, I mean, that's, as I'm told uh, by our tech analysts, that this is something that's kind of par for the course uh, for the industry. You know, you have people leaving here and there. It's it's not, not anything I think that's significant. And this has happened with Tesla for, for a long time, well, people I, leaving. I very much look forward to the announcements uh, and to seeing what the stock does both tonight and uh, in the next couple of weeks as investors digest yeah. it. So I'll tell you what people are going to like in regards to this. They would love if basically Musk today can commit to, I would say, uh, being asset light. Asset light meaning they're not going to take all the... Uh, the, the cost associated with the running their own fleet and things like that. I think people are going to want them to stay asset like have used customers, just be a service provider, right? Um, offer loans to people that want to run fleets of these vehicles, right? Um, and all those sorts of things. So then you make money off of that, which is a beautiful thing, right? Because you get the sales of the cars, but then you also get the services revenue. Then you say maybe they could make more money long term if they took more of an Amazon type approach and they really went asset heavy here and they wanted to own the whole fleet. Sure, but that's so ridiculously costly. These cars are, you know, very expensive, right? Even if Tesla's cost is, let's say, $25,000 to build a Model 3, start adding up the numbers on what they would need for a robo-taxi fleet, and it's just astronomically high numbers. It's not very realistic, right? So the moral of the story is Tesla's got to stay asset light in this. If they stay asset light, I think Wall Street's going to love that. It's going to be a little bit more of a Shopify-type experience, right? All right, next one up here, Tesla re-robot event, Dan Ives. What are we going to get? Are we going to get info on uh, cost per mile overall, scaling the cyber cab? Are we going to get info on whether they have a ride sharing app or insurance costs? I don't know. I want some details here. Are you going to get them? Yeah, I, th I think it's actually going to be heavy on details. I think importantly, this is really showing autonomous in terms of true autonomous as we go to level four, level five. This is really going to be a game changer for Tesla. And I think they're going to show on CyberCab and, and the roll-up, I think by the end of next year, this is something within certain cities that will be, you know, ultimately a reality. And I think when you actually start to go through per mile and you look at miles driven, I think from a fleet perspective, even relative to what we see with Waymo and everyone else, this is, I think it's a new chapter for Tesla. You do not walk away, shrug the shoulders. I think this is a game changer. You do. All right. So you're, are you, do you think you're going to walk away with enough information to put a model together, a discounted cash flow model or something based on your own assumptions in terms of where this thing goes that, you know, you can start to come to a, a, a number in terms of per share as to what it's going to mean for the company? Yeah, I mean, to me, it's really, OK, what's the timetable? Now, clearly, obviously, you know, some of the promises in the past have, have not worked out here. I think we're talking not just by the end of next year, but what's the ramble of the next few years, three to four years? What could that mean in terms of for the fleet, six million cars out there, potentially eight or ten over the next few years? What ultimately does that mean? This is pure margins. This is really building out a whole new business for Tesla. And I think we could be looking at something based on our math three, four years out. This could be 20, 30 percent overall profits. 20 to 30% overall profits for the of the of the company's profits will be from 
their effort here. I mean, you say that it's a uh, represents a trillion dollars of value for Tesla over the coming years. How do you get to that number? I mean, there I just look at look at FSD, look at autonomous relative to cars on the road. This is not just for Tesla. It's RV that they're ultimately going to OEM this technology. And when and, and when you look at even some of the numbers out there, I mean, we could be talking about 10, 20 billion annually per year that they're starting to to ultimately deliver when this ultimately gets to scale. And I don't view this necessarily as a massive threat to Uber, but just look what Uber did in rideshare. So I think when we look at the broader market here and ultimately the software driven and the margins, I, I view this, this will be a day we look back at three, four years from now that actually start to change the next phase of the Tesla story. You don't worry, Dan, about the regulatory approval needed for autonomous vehicles on a state-by-state -state basis, which is way, where they're given. I guess 29 states in Washington, D.C. currently have autonomous vehicle operation mandates. And I guess there are certain friendlier states like Texas. But isn't that a factor here? Oh, clear. look, I think David's question on the cost per mile, that's something I'd expect to hear about. And that's important in terms of what we're, what we're looking at. Regulatory is the biggest hurdle. And I think that's something state by state on the federal side, they're really, they're going to have work cut out for them. But that is something, I think it starts tonight, but over the coming 12, 18, 24 months, I think regulatory ultimately is something that they're going to be able to sort of navigate through. And I think that's the important thing tonight, not just the technology showing how we get there, what the roadmap is. Yeah, regulatory, that's a complete wild card. A complete wild card. Next one up here, calls of the day, Netflix, PayPal, and Nike. 20, it was at 780 at Morgan Stanley, outperform or overweight? They're overweight. Uh, Oppenheimer's outperform. They bump it to 775. So not quite as bullish, but nonetheless, both of these calls, they expect that stock to go higher from here. You own it in the, in the QDVO ETF. Yeah, I mean, I just think that they can continue to go higher. You can charge us whatever we, whatever they want, and we're going to pay for it. And the advertising <laughs> side, they now have 40 million members in advertising. So they can keep that model low and increase the cost of ads. Forget the content domination. It's about advertising and profits. Uh, okay, PayPal downgraded to market perform from outperform. Target uh, 80 bucks from 75 at Bernstein. This is a reasonably new uh, play for you. Yeah, look, the stock has run up a lot. So if if you had a buy recommendation on it much lower because of how cheap it was, now it's less cheap. But I want to point out, this is a stock that's barely down on this on this downgrade. Um, the uptrend has been pristine lately. I, I think it'll stay intact. I do have a stop loss in here somewhere. Uh, but PayPal is trading with an RSI of 60, so it's still very healthy uptrend. Both It's above both the 50 and the 200-day moving averages. That has not changed. It's 4% below 52-week high which just set recently and on a valuation basis it's a 19 pe backward a 16 forward and they're expecting to grow earnings by nine percent next year and that's absent any other new developments alex chris the new ceo has been pulling rabbits out of his hat for the last year since taking over and i want to bet with him so i'm going to stay long all right 100 percent. well put jb well put sir hey let's go baby not very often I actually uh, like one of these Wall Streeters, right? And like, oh, man, they're, they're, they're preaching to the choir here. Listen, he just laid it out, right? Around 19, trailing 12 month PE, forward PE, 17, 16 range in regards to this baby, right? Next year earnings per share growth should be either high single digits or low double digits for the company, right? Revenue growth should be high single digits or low double digits for the company. I mean, what's not to like in regards to this one? They're becoming more relevant by the day. Alex Chris has a company innovating at a rapid pace. I love it, man. I love it. So, yeah, definitely 100% uh, on board there. Honeywell downgraded to neutral from overweight. Target to 235. It's JP Morgan. Steve Tusa, by the way. Um, the well-known industrials analyst over there. Kev, you own this? Yeah, good analyst. Increased the price target, which I agree with. He claimed that the um, the spinoff looks diluted to him. I, I'm not sure I agree with that. We're going to be buying this on pullbacks. Over the next year, it will take some time to figure out what their revenue streams look like. But they were at free cash flow of $3.5 in 2022. They're back up over $5 billion for the past 12 By the way, I don't know if you guys knew this, but when you become a member of my private stock group, you get one of these steel cards sent to your house. And... You pull this out, and I can tell you, 
anybody just looks at it and they're like, oh my gosh, that you just get so much respect. And then if you join 1000X, you get this steel card here. Ooh, that baby sounds nice. Founding membership card. You pull out this, I'm telling you, man, any, any female in the world can be yours. You pull out one of those cards. They know, they know you pull out one of those steel cards, you got money, you got money. Automation, aviation, and energy, they're gonna benefit from the troubles. Better than knowing, pulling out the Amex like black card. I don't you pull out this, they're like, buy it on a pullback. you know, 3M, Josh, felt like it was a one-way trade. Um, you know, they, the new CEO, the stock was, off to the races, Ooh, everybody Celsius, 14% in love now? with it, including, including you, Link. Um, it was reiterated today underweight at Morgan Stanley. It's into earnings, $125 is the price target. What, what do you think about this call? The problem with Morgan Stanley is they just don't know what time it is. Like, they're focused on the past. I understand it's a 78 times trailing PE, but this is a company that's getting over just a horrific period of lawsuits and settlements and regulatory stuff. And all of that is in the past, including uh, prior management. So this is a stock now that is trading at a 16 forward PE. The median 10 year PE for this name is 17. So it's not overvalued by any stretch. If you're thinking about the future, not what's already gone on. Uh, this is the second best performing stock in the Dow 30 this year. It's up 46% year to date. I, I'm not saying it's the cheapest it's ever been. What I am saying is they've turned the page. There's a new group of shareholders who have come in to replace the old ones. And I think that the analyst is uh, reading from uh, an old script. Amazon Prime Prime is here. Today, Kev, target to 183. It's TD Cowan. Um, they did miss their revenue. What do you think about this one? Yeah, I agree with this call. We sold this out of our flagship dividend strategy. Amazon's Prime's here, and then the FedEx truck just went by. The damn FedEx people. They were supposed to drop off my new iPhone 16 Pro Max, blah, blah, blah. And you know what they did? I caught them on the cameras. They didn't even ring the doorbell. They just left a note. Like, dude, like, why didn't you ring the doorbell? Like, so I could get my package. Like, come on. Like, why be lazy like that, FedEx? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Amazon Prime never does that. Interestingly, it's in our growth portfolio. This is the 13th largest name in the queues. Go figure. Salesforce, overweight, 325, Piper, uh, Piper Sandler. Ten reasons to buy it. I'm not going to give you all, but they have to. <laughs> Uh, you own that one too. We have small positions in, in Salesforce. They've initiated a dividend. They've gotten stronger from a cash flow perspective. We buy it on pullback. All right, valuation, risk reward, free cash flow, blah, blah, blah. Uh, <laughs> Adobe, overweight. I mean, we want to go through all 10? I mean, you get the point. Adobe, overweight, 635, Piper, Sandler also. Uh, they have 10 reasons there too. Uh, margin, sentiment, valuation, blah, 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 blah. Rewind, the rewind is <laughs> exactly. Same, exactly. You know why they have 10? Because if it's like nine, people are like, wait, what? I know, why five wasn't nine? enough, let's go to 10. Seven minute abs. All right, uh, <laughs> Nike got upgraded. You, we told you about that survey, uh, I think it was yesterday, that Piper had as well, that teen survey, which was favorable for Nike. Shares got a bump. Today they're doing not much, but they did get upgraded at Truist to, to 97. You, you sold it a couple of years ago, and I guess no interest in getting it back? No, it's still on our board. We watch it. I don't think a China play is going to turn it around, but I thought the information yesterday from that survey was legit. It was relevant, and uh, I'm, I'm excited for them. Yeah, I, I, We're not buying it, but I'm, I'm happy. Okay. Not buying it. Come on, man. You got to buy it, baby. All right. Investors should be overweight equities versus fixed income. CPI inflation data due later this morning on the kickoff of earnings season. Tomorrow, joining us right now, Gabriela Santos, chief market strategist for America's for Also, how do I feel about 97 price target? I feel like that's fair. Uh, you know, one year from now, Nike 97, that's fair. You know, could it be higher? Could it be 100 plus? Sure. Uh, but I think 97 is a fair price target for one year. We're going to asset management, JP Morgan will be announcing their earnings tomorrow. Actually, before we even get to the CPI piece, did you, did you have a thought on this, this Fed meetings, mi Fed minutes from the meeting in terms of just how split they were over this uh, 25, 50, 50 basis? Because it's going to factor in our CPI conversation. Yeah, I think really the market had come around post strong jobs report to this idea that it's 25 from here. And if there was any doubt about that, I think the minutes clarify that. The 50 really was meant to be just a signal at the beginning. That's what got most members on board, with the exception right. of one uh, dissent. But really, the support here is to proceed gradually, 25 basis points at a time. And Do you think we're even going to do that now? I mean, we were talking about Mark Rowan yesterday from Apollo, who said, mm -hmm. there should be no, we don't even need rate cuts. Things are going so great. 
You save your cuts for when there's actually a problem and there is no problem. And I think that's where there's an interesting discussion happening here uh, about what the neutral rate is. So we've clearly normalized to a better uh, nominal economic backdrop. And we've seen that the economy has been less interest rate sensitive. So those are all signs that the neutral rate right. is much higher. Everybody thank my wife for ordering from Amazon Prime. Man's been out here for like five minutes delivering packages out there. Holy smokes. Was in that weird post-financial crisis time period. Now, how high it is, I think different firms, different economists Amazon, disagree. Um, and for us, it's between three, three and a half percent. So for now, there's still room for this, uh, what the Fed is calling policy recalibration. Right. Meaning to bring it from restrictive towards something closer to neutral. So you world. think for the rest of the year, we see what? And, and, let, and then factor the CPI piece of this into it. Yeah, so we think gradual from here, and I think for oh the stock gosh, market, that's perfectly pay. fine, oh, right? It's for good reason. The economy has been fine. It's really just about the Fed shifting from being very reactive right. to inflation to being more proactive with an eye on the labor market. So 25 in November, 25 in December, and then maybe uh, an additional uh, close to... I just had a vision. I just had a vision. This might be a good vision for all my fellow Amazon shareholders, right? So Mr. Amazon Prime out here finally got all our packages delivered. Then he grabs another package. I thought he was coming to our door, but he walked right across the street and delivered into that house over there. And so I just had a vision of like, you know, you remember the mailman? Uh, I mean, it depends on where you live in the country, but nowadays they kind of put all your mailboxes grouped together, right? But, you know, it used to be they go house by house by house, right? If you live in like an older community or something like that, every single house has its own individual mailbox in front of it. And so I just imagine a day when Amazon literally is delivering to every single house, like just this house, now this house, now this house, now this house, now this house. <laughs> it's just like everybody getting a delivery every single day because you're getting groceries delivered, you're getting all the other mass merchandise that order. Like, can you imagine that? I mean, maybe that might be a day in the future, right? 10, 20 years from now. And it's like almost like a freak thing, kind of like it's a, it was always a freak thing if somebody didn't get any mail in a day. What if it becomes like a freak thing where if somebody doesn't get an Amazon package in a day of some kind, it's like a freak thing, right? Maybe that's 10, 20 years from now. Maybe that's possible. Basis points next year, which would get us closer to this neutral of around three, three and a half. Could you percent. see a moment where we only do 25 basis points this calendar year at all? So I think it, it's going to be interesting because for many reasons. First, um, the data is going to get really cloudy, really soggy from here, the actual economic data. We've had strikes. We've had uh, two hurricanes, which are really going to complicate a clear reading from the labor market. And, and a lot of Fed members discussed that, actually, uh, during the minutes, even before Hurricane Milton. Um, so that data is going to get a little bit soggy. So they've really emphasized how they're going to try to look at uh, commentary from from companies from right. here on out. They've been doing a lot more of that. But you can Good. see how you get you to November and maybe they don't have a clear read. Plus, of course, it's going to be two days after the election that they're doing their decision right. uh, and remains to be seen. So how, how do you think that even impacts things to the extent it does? But we ultimately still think they're they're going to keep doing their thing, right. <laughs> which is uh, recalibrating interest rates. Ultimately, we do think they go another 25 basis points in November. I think the election... So, yeah, I agree with her. I agree with her 100%. Uh, I do think they're going to make a 25 basis point move. I would be shocked. I would be shocked if they didn't make any move. And I would be very surprised if they went 50 again. Seeing kind of how things are rolling in here, the latest jobs numbers seeing how the markets reacted, seeing how commodities have reacted to the upside. You know, you do another 50 and you could push commodities even a lot more. And then you risk inflation, second half of next year, even the summertime of, of 2025, right? So you don't want to get commodities going too much. So I, yeah, I, I feel 25 is an appropriate move. Last one, I felt 50 was an appropriate move. Now I feel 25 is an appropriate move. The actual policy impact. And then you don't make another move for the rest of the year. And then you kind of, you know, assess how things are looking in January, February. Is really feeding through much more to long-term yields, right? We thought the 10-year had really overshot on the right. downside there and makes more sense to have it around 4%. It's all about these fiscal discussions that are really top of mind. It's going to be the whole discussion for 2025. In the equities markets, what, what would you do as a result of all this? 
So I think, you know, for this month, there's a lot of headlines around politics and geopolitics. But if we actually just look at the trend, it's a perfectly fine economy uh, with rates normalizing uh, and with earnings, most importantly, normalizing finally in other sectors outside of just big tech. So ultimately, that's still an environment where we want to be a bit overweight equities versus fixed income. We've been talking a lot more how it's about what's happening beneath the surface. If you look at the average investor, when we look at our client portfolios, they have a huge 14 percentage point overweight to growth, precisely tech, precisely mega cap tech. So our discussion has been to normalize portfolio allocation. And we like other themes, broader AI implementation, which we see recently includes you. By the way, in regards to CPI, CPI, I believe today came in at 2.4, if I recall, uh, which is... Yeah, I, I believe it's actually lower than that. But the government numbers are at 2.4, which is right where the Fed wants it to be. That's that's literally perfect. That's literally perfect for them. Anywhere between about 2 and 2.5 is perfect range for them. As well, It's not digital. It's also physical infrastructure. It includes overseas like Taiwan, for example. Right. And we see Korea as being an interesting undervalued opportunity there. And then other themes. We've got electrification with industrials, healthcare innovation with healthcare. All right, I just want to go back. So you think, Ty- to do. You think you're investing in Taiwan and uh, as a country just broadly? No, so I think that... It- We've seen Taiwan up 30% this year. I think that's a sign. You're talking about Taiwan Semiconductor or you're talking about Taiwan the country? (laughs) Well, Taiwanese equities, 70% are are one company. But it's very tied to uh, the broadening of the AI theme. Right. Now, if we look at where else globally we could also implement the AI adoption theme, Korea stands out. Korea, uh, Korean companies have a lot of uh, memory chip uh, production, which is also used and necessary for AI digital infrastructure, plus a broader turnaround in um, electronic. Uh, and plus, it's not been doing very well. It's very discounted this year. Yeah, in terms of why I'm not the biggest fan of... Um, Let's say TSMC, like I've never owned that stock, not interested in owning that stock. The main reason is it is kind of a commoditized business in terms of like they can't just get some new outrageous rate or growth rate or something like that, right? And so it's a good solid business. I kind of look at it very similar to like an MU type business model, right? MU's got a uh, got a very good successful business, but you can't ever come in like a big PE on a stock like that, right? It's hard to get those growth rates to really go insane, which this FedEx truck is stopping in front of my house, which means I got to go get my iPhone. All right, guys, guys, appreciate you joining me. As always, once again, you want an in-depth Celsius video. If I miss this FedEx truck, I'm going to be screwed. If you want the in-depth Celsius video, check out the main channel. Additionally, pin comment down there if you're looking to apply to my private stock group, very wealthy group. Bye!